Hello, I'm Nathan Robinson of Current Affairs magazine, and today I'm going to argue that Ben Shapiro is scared of real debate because deep down, he knows he's full of shit. Conservatives frequently claim that leftists are unwilling to engage in serious arguments. Instead, we burn things down, punch people, and throw milkshakes on them. We do this, they say, because we cannot handle the facts. We are unreasoning, feely-type people, afraid of the truth. And we know that we'd be beaten in a battle of intellect. Now, one of these points should be conceded. Occasionally, a person on the left does throw a milkshake at someone. And that is because it's amusing to see arrogant people covered in milk. Admittedly, it's not the most mature and elevated way to settle a political dispute, but it's better than some alternatives. That's what you get for being a fascist! I find it strange when conservatives say that leftists are afraid of arguments. And that's because I spend my career debunking many of their arguments at considerable length. And yet a strange thing has happened. They don't reply by proving me wrong. Instead, when they've bothered to respond at all, it has been with name-calling and glib dismissals that don't actually address any of the points I've made. If the right really were very serious intellectuals, and my arguments were as sophomoric and silly as they claimed, you'd think they'd quickly and simply debunk the fallacious arguments I'd advanced. And yet, for some reason, they don't. Consider Ben Shapiro, the cool kids philosopher. I wrote an article about Ben Shapiro, uh, which everyone should read, explaining why I think he's not actually very smart or a philosopher, uh, and is instead just a person you might think is smart because he talks quickly and confidently and seems like a nerd. I made lots of arguments, and they were very good arguments. We'll go through some of them shortly. Now, here is how Ben Shapiro described me in response. Some guy that I've really never heard of, who's uh, kind of an obscure gadfly, who, his only, as far as I can tell, his only prominence in life has come from uh, writing a piece about me for, an, uh, for a magazine that he self-funds uh, or funds on charitable contributions and that nobody has ever read except for this one article about me. Shapiro is, of course, not wrong. I am but an insignificant gadfly, and he is the cool kid's philosopher. But I'd also draw your attention to the fact that this is, as they say, not an argument. I showed that Ben Shapiro was a sloppy thinker with gaping holes in his reasoning. His reply, in essence, was, I am very famous and you are not. Now, I presume you're thinking right now, well, but Mr. Robinson, as you say, Ben Shapiro is right. You are not very famous. Why should he engage with you at all? Good point. But let us rewatch some snippets of a recent interview Shapiro did on the BBC with Spectator editor Andrew Neal. You say in your new book, uh, you suggest that America's largest struggle at the moment is, quote, the struggle for our national soul. We are so angry at each other right now. And I, I think that's true. I've just returned from the United States. But aren't you part of the problem with the way you go about your discourse, not the solution? For example, you, dis you described Mr. Obama's State of the Union address in 2012 as fascist mentality in action. You said sure. Israelis like to build, Arabs like to bomb crap and live in open sewage. It seems to me that simply going through and finding lone things that sound bad out of context and then hitting them with and then hitting people with them is a way for you to make a quick buck on BBC off the fact that I'm popular and no one has ever heard of you. Uh, there are not many bucks to be made on the BBC, unlike American broadcasting, Mr. Shapiro. You can think whatever you want of me. Why don't you frankly, just try and I don't answer care. the I don't, I don't frankly give a damn what you, you think of me since I've new, never heard of you. You, and I've never heard of you until I briefed myself for this. You know, I, I'm not inclined to continue an interview with a person as badly motivated as you as an interviewer, so I think we're done here. I appreciate your time, All sir. right, thank you well, so much. thank you for your time and uh, for showing that anger is not part of American political discourse. Now, Mr. Shapiro, we'll say goodbye. Neil asked Shapiro a very good question. Why, if you believe in enlightened, mature, and civil political discourse, do you have a record of saying a bunch of really unpleasant, nasty, and bigoted things? And Shapiro's answer to Neil was, as it was to me, I don't know who you are, I'm famous, goodbye. Shapiro even called Neil a leftist. Why don't you just say that you're on the left? Uh, is this so hard for you? Why can't you just be honest? <laughs> Which is funny, 
because Andrew Neil is known in Britain as a rather loathsome right-winger. When tough criticisms come Shapiro's way, Mr. I Love Debate becomes Mr. Sorry, who are you? I have an appointment. I have to leave now. And Shapiro has very carefully avoided face-to-face -face confrontation with any of the leftists who are really good at debate. Glenn Greenwald, for example, has offered to debate Shapiro on Israel and has been met with silence. Shapiro offered to have Matt Brunig of the People's Policy Project on his show. Uh, but presumably Shapiro then watched some clips of Brunig and realized that Brunig is actually a very smart socialist who knows what he's talking about because Brunig never appeared on the Ben Shapiro show. Now, Ben's daily podcast is just him talking and he usually doesn't have guests on uh, that uh, disagree with him. Uh, on his Sunday show, he does have uh, some different kinds of guests, but note which side of the political spectrum they almost all come from. Is he having on the really prominent lefty sociologists, political philosophers, think tank fellows, and writers? He is not. Is this because he's asked all of them and they all declined? One very much doubts so. I realize that this may sound scandalous, but there's good reason to believe that Ben Shapiro doesn't actually care much about having an honest debate. He's known for online videos of him destroying various people, but note that these are structured in a way designed to make him look good. He, an experienced lawyer, takes on undergraduate students with them in the audience and him on the stage with the mic. In part, the setup allows him to look like he's owning them when he's not really making very good points. Consider this well-known clip in which Ben Shapiro argues with a student about whether trans people are the gender they claim to be. And if I call you a moose, are you suddenly a moose? Okay, if I redefine our terms. <laughs> no, it's a, yes, that's right. Men and women are a completely different thing. This is true. Shapiro looks here as if he's getting the better of the student, but is he? First, he's not really trying to have a fair conversation with the student. The student says that uh, the moose example is different from gender, and Shapiro then jumps and says, that's right, men and women are different. Well, that doesn't actually address the question of whether animal identification should be considered different from gender identification. And second, we, we know men and women are different. If there weren't differences, there wouldn't be such a thing as transgender people. The actual question here is whether our terms, men and women, should necessarily so refer solely to chromosomes. Now, gender is complicated. There are difficult philosophical questions here that require more than two seconds of thought and explanation, which is probably why Ben Shapiro struggles with them. Now, his position on gender pronouns has been responded to at great length and very effectively by uh, Natalie Wynn, ContraPoints, who pointed out that he just simply doesn't understand how language works. She shows that he's ignoring the argument that transgender people actually make, which is not a denial of biology, but a denial of the whether certain biological features of a person ought to be what our gender pronouns refer to. Now, note that Ben Shapiro has never actually responded to Natalie's argument. He's never offered to debate her. He's silent because she's right. Now, in order to dismiss the left, as a bunch of intellectual lightweights who don't have any arguments, Shapiro has to ignore the existence of intelligent leftists. So, for example, the transgender writer Julia Serrano has a PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry from Columbia University and spent nearly two decades studying genetics and developmental and evolutionary biology at Berkeley. It's tough to argue that Julia Serrano doesn't understand biology. Perhaps, if you think she's such an idiot, you might just be misunderstanding her position. Uh, if you're assuming that she thinks chromosomes aren't real or could be wished away with language, rather than thinking that it doesn't make sense to use chromosomes as the determinant of which gender pronouns should apply. Now let's have a look at this clip in which Shapiro argues with a student about socialism and worker cooperatives. I reject state socialism personally. What I'm referring to is specifically, for example, the term given to worker cooperatives, the most prominent example, the Mondragon Corporation in Spain, owned the, the uh, there is no investor or cap like capitalist group that pro owns the profits. When the company turns a profit, that profit is distributed among the workers, some 80,000 employees. It's a wildly successful corporation. I mean, is it a voluntary association? Is there any cram down happening? No, there's not. Then good, but it's capitalist. That's not, that's not, that's not socialist. <laughs> 
it's not. So Shapiro says that worker-owned enterprises, quote, aren't socialism and treats this student as dumb for not understanding what socialism is, despite declaring themselves to be a socialist. In fact, though, it's Shapiro who doesn't really understand socialism. He assumes that socialism is just having the government do things and cram them down your throat rather than uh, the private sector doing things. But that's not true. Having workers in control of their workplaces has historically been a major demand made by socialists, especially libertarian socialists. Uh, the student is actually expressing a very common position uh, that has existed throughout the socialist tradition. Shapiro assumes that the student is the one confused about socialism when he's actually just showing that he himself is unfamiliar with socialist thought and naively believes that socialism is solely synonymous with centralized state control of the economy. Now, we know that Ben Shapiro is far more concerned with making his opponents look bad than with getting to the truth. And those two things aren't the same thing. I can make you look bad by, say, surprising you with an argument you haven't heard and aren't quite sure how to respond to and causing you to get a little bit confused. Even if my argument turns out to be silly, I then look like the smart debater and you look like the dopey, confused, emotional SJW loser. You should have a look at Ben Shapiro's book, which is called How to Debate Leftists and Destroy Them. Now first, you should note that it's not called how to discuss things with leftists and figure out which one of you is right and concede good points while, that they make while trying to show your side of things. No, he just wants to humiliate people. Uh, as he says in his book, quote, you should debate a leftist if there's an audience. The goal of the debate will not be to win over the leftist or to convince him or her to be friends with him or her. That person already disagrees with you and they're not gonna be convinced by your words of wisdom, your sparkling rhetorical flourishes. The goal will be to destroy the leftist in as publicly a way as humanly possible. Now he then shows you how to use various kinds of strategies, which at one point he even calls parlor tricks in order to make the leftist look bad. Things like using the right body language or going on the offensive as quickly as possible uh, or pretending to be more moderate than you actually are. He says that rational debate with the left is all but impossible. And so he shows you kind of how to have an irrational debate with the left instead. And when you actually look through Ben Shapiro's body of work, you see that far from being committed to facts and logic, he cares only about the facts that support a conservative worldview and ignores all of the other facts that undermine it. So let's look at a couple of examples. So he has implied that poor people in the United States essentially choose to be poor because people who graduate high school, uh, have full-time jobs and are married, uh, uh, and end up above the poverty line typically. Um, and so that's evidence that you could, if you just got a job and graduated high school, you wouldn't be poor. However, if we look at the actual data, millions of poor people in this country are children, caregivers, and the disabled. So this advice to go get a job is absurd for those people. Here's another example. He, he, he's really somewhat despicably blamed Trayvon Martin, who was, uh, killed by George Zimmerman uh, for his own, own death. And uh, he claimed that George Zimmerman wasn't a racist, that there was no evidence that George Zimmerman was a racist, even though there's considerable evidence that George Zimmerman was, what it is, an unrepentant uh, racist. He uh, called Michelle Obama a baboon. He was thrown out of a bar for using the N-word. He sells Confederate flags on the internet. Um, and, and, and he's openly proud of having killed Trayvon Martin. And, and so, you know, and Ben Shapiro refused to accept, refused to look at the evidence that that was true. Or take the way that Ben Shapiro talks about the black-white wealth gap. Um, he was asked about the fact that, you know, white families tend to have way more wealth than black families. And he responded that this has nothing to do with race and everything to do with culture. How can you argue that racism is not a driving factor in income inequality? Because it has nothing to do with race and everything to do with culture. But, you know, when you think about that for a second, you realize that that can't really be true because the wealth gap has existed continuously since the time of slavery. I mean, average black net worth has always been way, way lower than white net worth. And there were massive structural obstacles to the black accumulation of wealth well into the 20th century, well after slavery. And, and we know that wealth is passed down through families. So it doesn't make any sense that Shapiro would conclude that the fact that the average white family has $13 of wealth for every $1 of wealth held by a black family, that that's 
the sole result of spontaneous contemporary black cultural choices, with no historical component whatsoever. The impact of human decisions on outcomes and the factors that shape the available range of choices. Now, these are difficult topics in social science. They don't have easy answers. Causality is quite hard to prove. But one thing we do know is that since black people were enslaved for 246 years and free for uh, 150 or so years, uh, and Jim Crow was in operation during the time of people uh, who were still alive being alive, thereby being a core determinant of both their life outcomes and the capital that they were able to pass on to their own children. Anyone who says that culture is everything and race is irrelevant, uh, they're really not seriously interested in trying to figure out how the world works. Or, you know, Ben Shapiro is the same incurious guy who claimed with a straight face that, quote, the United States has never conquered nations to take them. The United States has never conquered nations to take them. Now, the Cherokee Nation certainly might be interested to hear that. Or does he think that California, Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico, and Guam were all part of the original 13 colonies? This has been an imperialist country, I'm afraid to say. Now, he's not just an apologist for American colonialism. He has a history of saying horrible, bigoted things about Arabs, and has even, in one of his early columns, called for the outright ethnic cleansing of Arabs from Palestine, just removing them entirely from their homes. When people have pointed out this horrible record to him, he's responded, to, he responded in an interesting way. Uh, what he did was he created a list on his website of all the, quote, dumb stuff he has said, so, now that, suggesting that he, oh, he agrees, he's contrite, now he disowns it. But then in the, in the list, he kind of doubles down on some of the bigoted remarks. He's like, oh no, I was taken out of context when I said that, you know, Arabs just like to blow stuff up, or the Palestinians had, you know, a dark soul, um, and that these things weren't really bad at all. Um, but he doesn't want to be held accountable. He wants to insist that he was right all along. Now, if you want to see how bad his remarks about Arabs were, you're going to consider how we'd feel uh, if the same remarks were made about Jews, right? How, how would he feel if someone said the same kinds of things, you know, that they just uh, the kind of broad generalizations about, about Jewish people. If they tried to use the same excuse that he did, or it's just about their leaders, or if they said, like, like he kind of did, you know, oh, I just dabbled in ethnic cleansing when I was young, and the left is uh, using, oh, they, they, any, any excuse to attack me. Oh, they're just looking up the, uh, my record of ethnic cleansing. How unfair. I mean, you know, look, look at how quick he is to make charges of anti-Semitism. Uh, against others, like uh, people like Mark Lamont Hill, who just called for a free Palestine, Barack Obama, uh, Rashida Tlaib, uh, Ilhan Omar, and yet how reluctant he is to find any anti-black bigotry in the United States or any anti-Arab bigotry in his own statements. Now, I have a suspicion that Ben Shapiro would not actually do very well in a serious debate with a smart and effective leftist. And I suspect that because when he was confronted with a fellow conservative, uh, Andrew Neal, who asked Shapiro a very basic question on the BBC, he was kind of unable to answer and he fled. His appearance of intellectualism is a very carefully maintained fraud. Now, he happily debates those he knows he can beat, like uh, Piers Morgan or college freshmen. And then there are people People like Natalie Wynn, people like Glenn Greenwald and Matt Brunig, those people know what they're talking about. And he has to avoid ever speaking with them or responding to them publicly. Now, perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps Shapiro could beat the left in a fair fight. Of course, there's a way for him to prove it. He could debate one of us. He could actually try responding to some of our arguments instead of just saying things like, I'm more famous than you, but I think he knows. And if he did that, it could go very, very badly for him. Even worse than his disastrous BBC interview. And if that happened, his entire posture would crumble. All the stuff about how there are no honest leftists, how leftists are just bullies who rely on character assassination, how they're irrational and can't handle the facts, the very basics of the worldview he is selling would crumble instantaneously. So I understand why he's reluctant. The risk for him is very high indeed, but surely 
If he's confident in his powers of destruction, if he's not worried deep down that the leftists are smarter than he says they are, if he believes what he's saying is the truth, and not just a bunch of sloppy, half-reasoned talking points, then he won't shy away from the challenge. He'll seize the opportunity just to destroy the best the left has got. So what of it, Mr. Shapiro?